Welcome back to a new episode of the Animal Liberation Hour, brought to you by Animal Activism Mentorship. We are so grateful that you tune in every week to be inspired by the diversity of impassioned guests we have on our pod. It's crucial to AAM's mission as a free multinational program that supports and uplifts aspiring and seasoned animal rights activists alike. From one-on-one mentorships, free workshops and trainings, to this podcast, AAM seeks to empower humans to create the world they envision where all animals are treated with respect and compassion. In this episode, I had the pleasure of chatting with activist, author, speaker, filmmaker, and an eternal ray of hope, Magdalena Schnitze. We dove deep into her beautiful connection with the underwater world that inspired her environmental and animal rights activism. In fact, she has played pivotal roles in some of Sea Shepherd's most crucial missions to interfere with and disrupt the horrifying whale hunts. Maggie is unwavering in her dedication to creating a world where all animals, human and beyond humans alike, can live in harmony with nature. Currently, she lives in my dream destination of Italy and is gearing up to hit the road for her newest documentary titled Hope. This documentary will center the message of being active for positive change, showing compassion towards each other, and of course, the power of hope. Now, before we proceed to the episode, please be mindful that we do discuss mental health and Maggie's personal experience around suicide. So listener's discretion is advised. Without further ado, I bring you the delightful Maggie Schnitzel. Thank you, Magdalena, for joining us from Italy, correct? Yeah, it's correct. I'm in the north part of Italy, in the mountains. It's called South Tyrol. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. It's We at Animal Activism Mentorship are really on a mission to create a global community of activists who are fighting the good fight for all animals. And it's, it's such an honor to have you join us. Um, from my dream destination country of Italy. I hope to make it out there at some point. Um, but yeah, so excited that you're joining us today and here to share our, your story. Well, I'm very happy to share my story because, uh, yeah, I think we activists, we have to we have to connect and to really share what we face and what's happening in this world so we can reach other people's hearts. I think that's the most important thing to do. So thank you for this opportunity. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And I think just ha- one of the things that comes with talking to people from across the globe is that we can find inspiration in our differences, but also a sense of connection with our similarities. And it also shows that people who are here for the animals, for the people, for the planet are really, you know, we have more that connects us than divides us. And it, it's it's so important that we respect one another's activism and, you know, support one another as we, uh, as we take on a lot of powers that be, but still stay hopeful. So, yeah, one exactly. um I would love to start with the very beginning as we always do is where did that that uh, motivation the, that connection to animals first begin and how did you embark on your vegan or animal rights journey yeah nice to ask that that's that's one of the of the most um yeah, of, of the stories I share most because uh, I, at the moment, I am a speaker too. So I give many speeches about activism and about ocean conservation, animal rights and human rights and um, many topics. So this story is one I always share because it's, it, it's an emotional story. I, I was diving 
Uh, about 10 years ago, I made my dive uh, training or my, my first diving, um, I have no license. Yeah. And then about two years later, I was still an uh, easy diver. I was not dive master yet like now. And I was uh, booking, I, I did book two dives in Thailand and it was a holiday dive. And in the first dive, I made a connection with a fish where many people think that fishes are, you know, vegetables swimming around in the ocean. No, there's so much more behind. I mean, fishes are really loving, compassionate animals. And I did not really know that until that point. I was eating fish as well. And I didn't really care how fish get caught. And um, yeah, I, I saw a fish, a grouper. It was about one and a half meters big. And he was caught in a ghost net. Ghost nets are these nets which are lost from the fishermen, sometimes accidentally, sometimes consciously, uh, they stay behind and they catch on and on and on. And many animals, all kinds of animals are entangled in these nets for nothing because nobody takes these ghost nets out yeah. to eat the fish or the animals which are caught inside. So they're just dying for completely nothing. And um, I saw this big fish struggling in this net and the net was very thick and it was hanging behind or it was caught, the fish was caught behind his gill net, uh, his gills. And he couldn't move out. He was uh, moving around forward, backward, but he couldn't move out of the net. And I, the first time in my life, I, I felt this connection with this animal because I felt that it is my responsibility too. what is happening here. So the pain of this fish has to do with my choices every single day because I was eating fish and I didn't give a shit before how fish was caught. I really have to say that I did not care and yeah. did not question anything. And in this moment, I saw this fish struggling and I felt this is my my responsibility to help this fish. So I wanted to help him, but we didn't have anything, a scissor or any knife or something to, to help him. So at some point the air was out. We had to go out of the water and we had to make a small stop between the two dives. And I was sitting in, on the ship, on the deck of the ship, and I closed my eyes and asked myself these questions of, can I just move on to the next dive spot and do like fun dives and do like this is not my responsibility and do like this wouldn't, I wouldn't care for that. And I, my answer was, no, I, I can't. I can't just look away like I was doing 28 years of my life. And I stood up and I was going to our dive, ma dive trainer. And he was a guru in diving. He had already about 10,000 dives, was 70 years old. And I told him what I wanted to do. I, I told him that I want to free this fish now. I don't go with the boat to another dive spot. I just stay here. Whatever they do, I stay here. I will free this fish. And he was really smiling. His whole face was smiling because he wanted to do the same. But as a dive instructor, you cannot just cho choose to do that when the diver are paying for the dive and that's so easy so he said that's what we will do now that's amazing we go there and all the boat the whole ship had to stay at the same place dive the same dive because of this decision so we went back into the water we had a scissor knife and we cut this net open and the fish was free so he was fish uh, swimming away i wanted to say he was running away no he was <laughs> swimming away and like, hiding goodbye the and just wanted to bolt it out of there <laughs> yeah, though he was hiding under the corals because he was probably as well in pain because his, his uh, gills on one side were a bit broken. Mm. So he didn't look crazy good, but he was free. And I was really happy to at least have done this part and to help him this way. And I took the net under my arm and we swam on. And I thought this day can't get, can't get better. But in the end, I was wrong because we were swimming on. And some minutes later, this fish came out of his place, of his um, where he was hiding he came out, he swam two words, us, he swam next to me side by side for some minutes and he looked into my eyes and at the same time into my heart because I felt I felt this deep connection with this animal and I felt that he wanted to say thank you. He was not scared anymore. And this moment changed my life. I was, I was going into holidays as I was a tourist, but I came back as an activist in my heart. So this, this fish changed everything. From this moment on, I became an activist. I changed all of my life. I did not do anymore what I have done before. I still needed time to understand the whole thing and to process it, to become vegetarian first and then vegan. So this still took me a bit of time. I did not become vegetarian right away. Now I think, why not? <laughs> but I question it, right? But yeah. I was not ready yet. I needed the process. I needed some time to get into this. And um, yeah, but that was the start for my activism. Wow. Yeah, this is me. <laughs> My, yeah. I loved everything about that story, but I just, right when you said I went in as a tourist and I left an activist, oh, so powerful. <laughs> Love that so much. Yeah. 
And that shows as well how fast and how easy every single one can be touched so much that we can change everything. By something so, so simple, right? And I feel like people make connections like that with their those who have companion animals. Um, not everybody, uh, of course, is responsible with their companion animals, but people have a very deep connection with them. And yeah. I find it, you know, not but not everybody who makes that connection you know, relates that to other beings. It's like, oh, I love my dog. I'm going to care for my dog. And that's it. And I'm always fascinated by what about, what is different about the people who make that, who go the extra mile to say, hey, if I care about my dog, then why am I contributing to the suffering of this fish or this, or the cow or the pig? And People still enjoy watching these cute cow videos or watching um, them break free from a slaughterhouse and go to a sanctuary. People like seeing that, but they don't necessarily, the behaviors don't necessarily um, align with that that recognition. So what do you think is that barrier? And I, I, of course, I'm not expecting the the answer, but I'm just curious as to what your opinion is. Yeah, I think uh, it's a hard question because I think it's for every person a bit different. Mm-hmm. Because uh, you know, I am so I was so touched by the story with the fish that he touched my heart. I think the most of the time it's an emotional connection which changes something. But I still need a time as well to go the way of being vegetarian and then becoming vegan. Maybe because of all the traditions I got told my whole life and the things what I believed I need to eat this and that to be healthy and all of that. I think there are many components which are creating this misunderstanding of uh, connections to the animals and as well to the ocean. I was not, I, I did not, well, I was not, a, I did not understand how much, how important the ocean is for us all to survive. Nobody told me in school that we need the ocean in a healthy uh, way, that we have even oxygen to breathe. So this connection, nobody told me. And all of these informations have not been there because I think that our Traditions here did not allow us to know these things because then we would have to change our traditions. And people don't want to change their traditions, their mindset, their beliefs and the things they have always done because that's the way it is. And I think there are many, many different components. So I I think there is not one answer. There is many answers for every person. It's a bit different. Some people become vegan because of animal rights. Some people become vegan because of their health. And I don't care what reason it is, someone goes vegan, but at least go vegan. But yeah. I think there are really many, many ways how people are getting touched by uh, by, by the knowledge and by using it and uh, implementing it in your own daily life. And I think as well that every person has a different lifestyle. I, for example, I don't have kids. I, I am able to travel around if I want to. Uh, to to be activists. I can go on a sea shepherd campaign for five months if I want. I don't have to tell anyone that I do that. Well, now I have a dog, so I need to care for him and to see and find out. But yeah. but if you have a family, it's not so easy. So there are many ways how you can contribute, but it needs to be aligned with your lifestyle a little bit that you can um, mm-hmm. yeah, make steps to go into it, but you don't have to change everything from one day to the next. I think that's what many people are scared of. That mm. if I want to do something for animal rights, I have to become vegan right away. No, I, I you, you can do it step by step. To go vegan right away is probably not really many times happening. Some people do. Amazing. But most of the people are afraid of these big steps. So make small steps. I think that's an important thing. And uh, yeah, I think really that it's there is no one answer. There are many barriers which make make us think small, keep us small. It might be the system where we grow up. It might be our belief system, our own. Uh, it might be things we are used to have in our lives and we don't want to let go of them. Like, for example, eating meat. Uh, there are many, many, many barriers, I think. And the important thing is to, to build a community around yourself with people that are already doing where the things you want to, to implement in your life because then you get a lot of information, a lot of help, a lot of support. I think that's what helps us a lot to really make many small steps or even bigger ones. Yeah. Yeah, that's really very valuable because I know there were there had been a study done that showed that one of the or the leading cause of recidivism amongst those who try to 
go plant-based um, was the the social aspect, not uh, lacking a community. And if you're able to find that community, you're going to feel less alone and you're not going to feel isolated, which is very powerful because we are social creatures. And you did mention steps and people on their own journey, meeting people where they're at. And that is, I think, is very important because um, I think that's the way that you can have sustained long-term change uh, If because you have come to that realization. You have recognize the why, um, like, why are you doing this? But I also am trying to grapple with the current climate catastrophe we are in. And it's, we need large scale change fast. And if we're going to wait for every single one of the more than, of like the nearly 8 billion people on the planet to each take their own time to come to that realization. What if we don't have a planet to live on? Like how that's something that I really worry about right now. Cause it's, is, do I feel this way because I'm already vegan? I'm already an activist or do I, or is, so yeah, I'm just trying to figure out what is a good way to have that balance of respecting people's process Mm -hmm. while also, you know, emphasizing that this, you know, can you get a, be a little faster on your process? Yeah. I mean, I, I for example, give speeches in schools a lot mm-hmm. uh, the last years. And the main, the most of the speeches people, the schools want is a speech or a workshop about plastic, the plastic issue, which is connected very much to the ocean too. Sure. And um, and I'm speaking about plastic since about eight years. And I, I have these big questions in myself where I ask myself, how long do I still have to talk about the same issue until you get it, guys? It's not a, so hard to understand to just leave away the plastic bottles and these things which single use plastic shit nobody needs it i mean there are really really many easy steps to do it but um i felt as well that if i go that way and ask myself all the time these questions how long do you still need i'm getting crazy and i i'm I'm getting crazy and even disappointed by by not uh, seeing this change as fast as i want to see it that does not really help myself then in the end Mm -hmm. and i think it costs me so much energy and my my fire is burning out because i feel like oh my god the people don't get it (laughs) you know that i i have the feeling then i cannot really reach many people anymore because my energy is getting smaller and smaller Mm -hmm. so that's what i try to do is to motivate and inspire people by showing them that everyone can every single day make a difference which is in the end contributing to your own personal development and it's such a big big change what you can face what you can experience by helping to pick up some trash by changing one piece of whatever you buy every day to another which is more sustainable and more and better for the for the world less bad for it and i think that's i don't know but people are you can reach people in a different way it depends always on who you talk to but i think some people even are easy to talk to when it's about money saving mm-hmm. money or you know that that is a big contribution when people understand how much you can save money when you do different things and they these different things can be so much better for the world mm-hmm. if you find the good examples and there are many so this is always a different way of from which point do you talk to the people with who are the people you talk to? What is their motive to change something? And why would they change something? Mm-hmm. So what do they want in life? And if you find the right point, what is the most important in this first moment for these people, then you find a way to, to show and to share your way of living and the vegan lifestyle with them yeah. by finding the point they they are most interested yeah, that's why we that need. Yeah, that's why. That's exactly why we need diversity in activism. Yeah. That's why we have to be respectful of different people's approaches and not, um, you know, we need all hands on deck. We need different tactics. We need yeah. different ways to reach out to people and speak their language. If health is the way in, there are people doing that. If yeah, um, the then you send them the movie Game Changers. Check Ooh. it out if you want to do sports and you are afraid that you're not healthy enough when you eat vegan and you can't do your sport anymore. 
watch watch this movie. But if you want to uh, do it because of an emotional thing, an emotional connection for the animals, then you have other many other approaches. And watch other Earthlings like and then cry yourself yes. to sleep. Yeah, yeah you cry yourself <laughs> completely out, and then then you understand and you go vegan. I mean, there are really many different approaches, and I think it's very important to really know what is the approach for this person I am talking to right now. Yeah. Because if I keep always my same approach, I can keep my same approach, but the different informations. I share not always the same information. Sometimes I share different ones because mm-hmm. I know ah, this person is more about that and mm-hmm. is more about this. So I change my way of doing it. But I think it's really, like you say, a very important to have this diversity of activists, yeah. which come from different angles, look at the things from different angles and from a different perspective. And then we can create so much change because there are all facts out there, all yeah. of them. There are enough of uh, information available to share. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, wonderful. And throughout your process coming along have there been um any mentors who have inspired you and your activism and what do you that's part one part two is how do you aspire to mentor um up-and-coming activists who you interact with well, I have uh, had many mentors or many idols. And if it's, for example, if it was about vegan cooking, a friend of mine, Nikki Bota from South Africa, she she's a vegan chef and she's such an amazing chef that I was inspired by the way he, she's cooking. There I learned to cook vegan. Um, I mean, she was a mentor in this, like yeah. insane. And then I have mentors like, for example, of course, um, Paul Watson, uh, Lex Shailert, which is the founder of the Elephant Nature Park in Chiang Mai, or, um, or friend, a friend of mine here, which not, not, not many people know her, but she's a mother of four kids and she has not much free time. She's a teacher as well. And at the same time, she takes all of her free time, what she has to, to create change, to help people. And I think, you know, the mentors can be people who are, very much known, but it can be people who are next to you, your neighbors, which are doing uh, so much to change this world in, in, even in the little. And uh, I had so many mentors in the end, I have to say, even people who don't give a shit are mentors in a way, because there I, f- I see and learn how I don't want to be. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's a mentor too. It's like teaching me, okay, this is what I definitely don't want. Yeah. And that's big teaching in our life sometimes we do we need to know what we don't want to understand what we really want mm. and i think in every person you can learn something or from from every person you can learn something yeah yeah that's so cool and have do you work with um uh with volunteers do you do you mentor people i know you give a lot of talks at schools um how has how has that experience how, how have those experiences shaped your um role as a mentor to these young um students who i'm sure want to you know create yeah, positive there change there are many kids uh, after the speeches i give for workshops there are many kids uh, writing me and there are so many i see it all the time that they want to change they want to do more but they don't feel the support or not from the school, from the parents or from their surroundings. So they sometimes write me because they, they think that I can give them a bit of support. So I try my best. The, my time is limited as I work on many, many projects. But I try to connect as much as I can and show them what the possibilities are in our area or even outside and uh, what they can do. So my mentoring is more really supporting in this way. Uh, but at the same time, I, I am a founder of a big, uh, beautiful foundation since a short time. And there we are supporting many organizations worldwide financially. And there, because of this, I get in touch with many organizations because I try to find out who do we want to support. And there it's always, again, uh, at the same time, I'm giving and sharing and mm-hmm. receiving, like uh, mentoring each other and mm-hmm. helping each other. And in it's a, way a two-way of street, support. right? It's a two-way relationship, yeah. a mentor. You can, yes. just because you are the mentor doesn't mean you can't learn from the mentee, right? They have, the, oh, their stories you. have something to offer too. Yeah, totally. I think I, I see that all the time. It's like a really sharing, uh, exchanging of information, of support, of hope, of cura- courage, of uh, so many things that we can really help each other. And uh, I think that's the most beautiful thing. If we start to see it like that, like not just giving, giving, giving. No, no, no. Giving is always a receiving too. Whatever you send out in this world, it, it comes back to you in one way or the other. But uh, it, it's it's coming. It's energy. 
And uh, we, when we start to see it like that, I think that more people are okay and, and happy to give, yeah. <laughs> to share. Can True, share it's like, people. oh, if I do more good, then I'm going to get some good. So it's like, okay. What you give, yeah. it's coming back to you. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. And so you um, touched on this foundation that you started. Can you tell us a little bit about that and the work that you do? Yeah. Yeah, very, I'm very happy to do that because it's a foundation where everyone worldwide can uh, support and be part of because uh, this is a foundation, the first project I was working on with a company together at my home. And this company wanted to give more back to the world. They always donated already from their income. But now we created a really big project. It's called Sanus Planet Foundation. And the company has their own coin system. But the cool thing is from the end of this year, worldwide people and companies can uh, accept this coin to be as a payment. And every time when someone worldwide pays with this coin, with this payment system, some part of the money goes into our pool. And this is the money what we donate to amazing organizations worldwide. Means um, worldwide people and companies can be part of it and say, hey, we want to choose as well this payment system in our place. People can pay with that. And if people pay with that, every time it's something donated. And all of this money which is donated, I can choose where it ends up. So mm-hmm. I choose the organizations we support. And it's quite big and it's, it's starting to be really, really huge because it's a win-win effect from all sides. But imagine if you, for example, every time when you pay with a credit card, there is money donated. That would be an insane amount of money in the end. But this is not happening. There's just charges going to the companies of the credit card. And you know that that money, we don't know what, what's happening with that. And here the system is completely um, transparent and we show how much we donate and where the money goes. And all of this money is 100% donated. So this is really cool. And every company will like can be part of it. Every per- private person too. So you can say the next time, whenever it's possible, I pay with this instead of with a credit card or instead of other money. I pay with that through my phone, very easy. And I can see right away on the phone, on this app, how much is donated from my, um, yeah, from the things I buy. And I think I am still, I'm the activist which always talks about consuming less. That's that's what I am standing for. Consume less and but don't buy the things you don't need. Mm-hmm. If you don't need it, just don't buy it. Yeah. And if you need, if you buy things, I'm still a consumer. If I buy the things, I choose what I buy, why I buy it, if I really need it. And if I buy and pay for it, then I pay with a way in a way that is giving something back. So that's a really, really nice project. Yeah, everyone can write me if someone is interested in getting more to know more about that one. That's really fascinating. And what kind of organizations do you collaborate with in terms of um, of uh, those who are receiving these donations? Are they also international? Are they uh, or are they only animal rights based organizations? Um, no, there are organizations which are based on animal rights, human rights, ocean conservation, and nature in general. Conserving. Yeah. We have, for example, one organization I worked with already as well, an activist in uh, Malaysia, because I'm a coral propagation trainer. And this is a coral propagation organization. It's called Ocean Quest. We support them to, pr- to plant corals. Then we have an organization in Ecuador, which is um, caring for the indigenous people's rights and for not cutting down the rainforest for things like oil um, drilling. Yeah. Then we have an organization in uh, Indonesia, which is cares for or first of all, uh, orangutans, and another one in Indonesia as well, which cares for sharks, like uh, Medicine Stewards um, Organization Project HIU. We support, then we have a planting tree organization with, with kids, where kids plant trees. Then we have another organization in Cameroon, which is uh, providing girls, especially girls empowerment, to provide 50 girls to go to school mm. for the next years. So there are many, uh, it's a big variety. There is no limit. The thing is we have, we focus more on smaller organizations Mm -hmm. because my, what I learned in the last years is as bigger an organization, as easier it is that things are going towards a way I don't really like because a lot of money is lost in administration costs, which is not always a bad thing. Sometimes it's needed, but sometimes it's not, not a cool thing. So I try more to focus on smaller organizations we might support definitely Sea Shepherd, but it's starting to be bigger too. But I mean, there are, it, it depends always on how the organization works. Uh, and Sea Shepherd is one I would definitely support, even if it's growing and getting bigger. But there are other organizations which are huge I would never support. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I choose and I, I, I really talk with the people, the founders of the organizations a lot and keep in touch with them to see what the, do they do, where does the money go. And this is a very important part of my work at the moment. Because I think that's one of the most important things to have this transparency and to really see what is happening with the money. 
Yeah. Otherwise, it goes to a place where I think, okay, this is not something I really want to support. So we have to think more about where do we send our money to? Exactly, exactly. Because that money is going to be spent in maybe not the best way. And you want to make sure that what you what the resources that you're providing are also doing good. It's not just you supporting good, right? Yeah. 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 So, of course, I'm sure we have listeners who are huge fans of Paul Watson and the fierce work that Sea Shepherd does. So I feel like I will not be doing any of them justice if I don't ask you about your time with Sea Shepherd. What kind of work were you doing? What was it like to work with Paul Watson? Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I recently watched the documentary, um, Watson, uh, the Watson documentary, and I was like, wow. Nice. That's yeah, just wow! It, it, like what hearing him narrate the story sounded so simple. It's like, oh, I wasn't happy with how this was going, so I just started um, this organization. <laughs> yeah. And but when you really see the scale of it, it's wow! It's just that's the only word that comes to mind. So tell me about how you got involved with um, the work and your experiences. Any standout stories? Yeah. Yeah, I do. I do um, actually make my own podcast too, the Sound of Planet podcast. And I interviewed Paul for that. So you can, if you want, you can check out the interview. It's really nice. I was, uh, my first campaign with Sea Shepherd was in 2014 when I became team leader and then later ground leader in the Faroe Islands because there many whales are still getting uh, killed for traditions. And um, that was my first campaign when I got arrested as well because I put myself between whales and whalers. So I was in prison for one night and one day. And uh, there is a funny story I could share. For example, when I was team leader, I had to um, I had to communicate with the police after we got arrested. When we got even um, found found guilty because it was called guilty in the name of um, disturbing public freedom because we tried to save whales. That's the, the disturbing the freedom, right. right? Right. So yeah. Well, there was a police officer, a small woman. She had a very small, angry mouth, lips, and she was always like coming to us. We have to pay the fine, and we have to pay the fine. And I said, I don't pay a single cent for you killing on. I mean, I don't do that. And then she said, well, if you don't pay, then we put you back in prison this time for a whole week. And I said, well, you can do that because in the end, we got vegan food in prison. I had my own bag, but I did not even always have when I was in the volunteer house because we were so many volunteers, so I had to sleep on the floor. So I had my own bed in prison. It was not a bad thing. They washed my clothes, put me in prison. It makes a lot of publicity against what you are doing here. So do that. I don't pay a cent. And she said, no, but then it costs too much money. Then they kicked us out. <laughs> so they kicked us out of the island. Yeah. But there are many, many funny stories too, but really hardcore stories as well. When we got arrested, the whales got killed right next to us. And that's some heartbreaking moments, yeah. what you never really completely um, lose again. Maybe you carry them with you. And um, you the, went the, there, you put I, yourself between the attackers and these vulnerable whales and to feel like you couldn't, and I don't want to say failed, but that's probably yeah. how one would feel to not be able to protect them and also witness what they yeah. weren't able to save them from. And yeah. what? Yeah, you feel like a failure, but really, I have to say, these 33 whales which got killed that day were the first whales which did not die in vain. Because we filmed everything, we showed it the whole world, and the whole world was watching. They started to see what's happening there, it started to become a big thing. The first whales, which no, no single whale ha- should die, no single one. But these first ones have been really filmed, like, and there was a big publicity about that, and it became a really big topic again uh, that people worldwide started to write articles about it, started to talk about this topic and things started to, to change. Mm. It's not changed how we want it yet, uh, far away from it, but things started and conversations started about this topic. And this was in the end, the first step to bring or to, to support change to happen. And uh, yeah, in the end, it, we feel, I feel still feel like we failed that day, but on one side, I think we have done everything we were able to do. There were too many people around us which were there with knives and weapons and they were screaming at us and really it was not an easy moment or an easy half an hour. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, we tried everything we were able to do. Yeah. So yeah, we gave what we could give. Yeah. And during times like this, um, what keeps you hopeful and optimistic when you... It seems... It seems like when I hear these descriptions or 
see documentaries where footage like this comes out, I tend to feel very dejected and that, wow, this, there's just so much that needs to be done. And it seems like such an uphill battle, but then we also want to stay optimistic, hopeful and motivated, but also practical. So how, how do you handle that? I have to say I had these moments when I felt in deep holes, deep black big holes, and I thought I had no idea how to get out of that. Mm -hmm. And every time when I felt or when I found myself in these holes, mm -hmm. I had so many amazing activists around me. And these activists were the ones that always gave me this courage and this hope to move on because I saw there's so much good happening too. Yes, there is this one side, which is hardcore shit happening. Mm -hmm. But then on the other side, there's so many beautiful people caring And I try to uh, work as well on forgiving, forgiving the people who don't know yet. I did not know it neither before. I did not have this connection before. I did eat animals. I didn't care. And I think, I don't want to say some people are farther than others. I don't want to, to, to judge, but I know that I had to go through some things to be where I am right now. And I know that not everyone has these or experiences, the stories and the connection I was able, allowed to experience. So I think people, some people take longer. Some people don't, don't see or feel what we feel. And uh, I try to really work hard on forgiveness, not to point the finger on them. These are the bad ones, but to really send forgiveness and to really connect with these people, to share with them as well why I do what I do. And I was, by doing this, I was able to not completely transform, but to open people's hearts already for the topic. And I think that's, for me, it, it turned out to be the way uh, how I can reach so many more people than, than the people there which are already on the way. But so many more which have no clue about these things yet. And for me, I think this is my way of how I want to move on to send uh, forgiveness and to to try to sh share my stories, which are very many emotional stories. And I think we all are people with the heart. We all have a heart. We all feel emotions. Even if sometimes we try to uh, hide behind walls, right? But this is sometimes just because people are afraid of what is outside of this wall. So I try to crack this wall Step by step. Would, yeah. You know, <laughs> Just chip at it a little. Yeah. Get a little bit into that. <laughs> That's very <laughs> valuable advice, too, for um, a lot of activists. And I'm seeing people, you know, going out, protesting the fur industry, protesting the rodeo that is um, a sport in the United States, um, protesting all forms of animal abuse and exploitation. And being confronted with really untasteful remarks and comments, but also, you know, how, how, what advice do you have for activists who are putting themselves in this place, especially new activists who yeah. might, you know, feel overwhelmed and um, just to keep that hope going and to keep them showing up. Because um, yeah. we want yeah. to be sustainable, but that means not burning out. That means knowing yourself knowing how much you can take on but yeah. also not compromising on showing up um, yeah. in your fullest capacity so what advice do you have for people to um, take care of themselves while also advocating yeah. for the animals yeah that's a really big question a good question because I think uh, I think carry what you can but do it don't carry more than you can uh, we are sometimes carrying so much When you start to feel and to open up, you feel emotions that are coming from all sides and it's turning out to be so heavy that it can put us so much down. And I know exactly what can happen when you are when you stay in this hole. Because um, I share this not with everyone like that, but my boyfriend was an activist. He was a sea shepherd. He took his own life. He committed suicide just about one and a half years ago. And he was working on the documentary Hope with Me Together. We started our movie project together. I am working on this documentary now alone. I mean, without him. Um, but this was kind of a crazy, crazy situation and a crazy year and a crazy thing that happened. And he fell in this hole and he did not get out anymore. 
And I think what I, my advice is really take care for yourself as well. If you don't care, take care for yourself, you can't carry anything. You can't change anything because you're burning out. So take care for yourself. Take the times where you enjoy life, where you come, come, where you connect to nature and just enjoy the nature. And without all the time, the feelings of this is wrong, that's wrong, that's bad. Connect with people that are really so much connected to this world, how you are connected to those people. Build a network. Build a network of those people that are exactly doing what you want to do and what you are doing already. This is the best support we have, the foundation on where we can really build more things together. But don't put yourself in a small hole and stay there because you feel alone. In the end, alone means all one. We are all one. We are all connected with each other. So you're never really alone. But uh, when I started to become an activist, I had not this network. I, I didn't have this network and I felt alone so many times. And it was quite some time needed to build this network. So my first advice is really build a network and then carry this, what you can carry, but don't carry it more because that's too much. You can't, you can't uh, by, by doing what you do, you will not be able to change everything on every problem from today to tomorrow, but you can become part of the solution and see it like that. The focus is a very big and important thing. Where do you put your focus on? Do you put the focus on all the things that are going wrong or do you put the focus on the solutions you can provide? Because if you are acting already, you are the hope giver and bearer for this world. You are a solution bringer. So see yourself as such and not as, oh, I can do anything. No, because it's not true. People who say you don't change anything are the people who don't want to change. That's the only one saying that. No one else who ever changed something told me you can't change anything. I mean, this is just coming from people who just don't want to change. So don't listen to these people. I think we we humans, we are very much, we, we are very good in not listening, but we are not listening to the things we just don't want to hear right now. Start to use this ability to not listen to those who want to tell to you that you can't change anything because you can exactly do that. Yeah. And that's my, my biggest advice. Believe in yourself and believe in the collective of people who are all coming together, changing this world step by step together. Yeah. Wow. Thank you for sharing that, that story. And I'm, I'm, we are deeply sorry for your loss and appreciate that these conversations about taking care of one another, our mental health is very important. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like you said, knowing what you can handle, how much you can handle and taking care of yourself, finding community, finding support is, is very, mm -hmm. um, uh, it's, it's not talked about as much as it should be. I feel in activist space. So I, I really, admire that you are using your platform to really advocate for that. So thank you for sharing um, your story. You. And you talked about... There's one, there's yeah. one thing what Paul Watson told me in the yes, interview, for yes. example. And he said, don't worry about the future. Concentrate on the present because mm. the present is the moment where you create the future. Um, so do what you can do right now in this moment, in this place where you are right now. Because everything else is uh, or too far away or it's in another time but the only time where we can create something is now mm -hmm. and here yeah. so concentrate on that yes definitely wise words from paul watson <laughs> definitely and you talked about um your challenges uh becoming an activist can you tell mm -hmm. us about your journey from making that connection with this fish to actually becoming active for the animals and what that story was yeah yeah the fish in the end opened my heart mm -hmm. and then i i just when i came back home as an activist in my heart I, I i felt that i can't go on with my life like i was doing before so i had to really change everything so i started to collect trash because i knew that the trash thing was the biggest problem in the ocean yeah. what what i saw in this moment maybe the bigger problem is the overfishing and there are many problems but this was the the problem i just saw right there so i started to collect trash i saw this problem i said i wanted to be part of the solution so i started to collect trash and i started to remove ghost nets uh, underwater and i started to be part of campaigns because i i when i collected trash i i 
asked many divers to come with me while I did my dive master training. I asked them to come with me to collect trash. At some point, I had the feeling I want to do more than collecting trash. I want to really be part of a really beautiful organization. So I met Sea Shepherd. So I became a Sea Shepherd, have done in the meantime about seven campaigns with Sea Shepherd worldwide. So I was on the, the open sea about 35 months in the last years with Sea Shepherd. And I got to know so many different topics. And I saw everything what I have done before from different angles every time. So I learned my knowledge was growing about the ocean conservation, about animal rights, about veganism. It was growing step by step. And then I started to give the speeches in schools to share my knowledge about that and became an author. I wrote two books now. One is a vegan cookbook and uh, with a lot of information about the background of veganism. And one is a book about hope that just came out uh, about one month ago. There are many stories of myself inside and uh, as well how these stories made me to the person I am today. So I want to share this, this uh, personal development I was going through. So it was in the end a step-by-step -step change and why, because I was a media officer at Sea Shepherd Campaigns as well, mm -hmm. I did all of the videos for the social media channels. I saw so many times that there are so many uh, things happening that feel hopeless. But there, I told you before, I had this feeling of so many people around me, surrounding me, doing something for hope and to share hope. So I started to make my own documentary on hope with with uh, my boyfriend then at that time together and now i'm working on this documentary completely it will be a, 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 a cinema documentary it will be really a big project so i became as well the founder of the uh, sam's planet foundation or co-founder and i think these big projects i'm working on right now they just happened because i never gave up mm. i mean the the first years i was giving speeches for free. I was writing all schools that I want to give these speeches because it's so important, the topics. And the, the schools, they didn't care so much. They said, well, ocean conservation is far away from us. I live in Italy, but in the northern part, there's no ocean. Mm -hmm. It's in the mountains. I mean, there, there is no ocean. People have no idea what the ocean means to us. So I came with, oh, I want to give a speech about ocean conservation. The people were like, ah, we don't care about yeah. ocean conservation. It's far away. But I said, it's so important. We have no clue about it. I have to give a speech about ocean conservation. I give it for free. So I gave about 150 speeches for free in schools. Just because I, I was sure that this topic is so important. And now school started to invite me. I mean, all, also this just happened because I didn't give up. So one other advice I can give is don't give up. Yeah. Just don't give up. Stay there. Go focus on the things you want to change. Go for it and uh, don't give up yeah. because it's definitely worth it. This beautiful world is worth standing up for it. Definitely. And when we, we are asking people to be active for the animals, but one of the very crucial elements that you have beautifully described is that also requires being active and finding a community. And you can't just sit in one place and wait for activists to knock on your door and be like, hey, join us. You put yourself out there. You started going to cleanups. You start, you mobilized your own existing network of divers. And then you came across Sea Shepherd and you, you know, you found your crew and that. Yes, and, completely. Yeah. And I think that is so powerful that you've made these important relationships and friendships who are going to be there when, you know, things don't look all rosy and happy and uh, they're, yeah. they're, you can feel shitty with, it's nice when you can feel shitty with a group of people who are fighting yeah. for the same thing because you can uplift <laughs> one another. Yes. And you know, when you're talking about, about shitty things, yeah. I wrote a, a chapter in my book about that because I think that shit can be very important. Even though I know to go through shit is not a nice thing and it's a hardcore thing, it's not beautiful, but I think we all have this pile of shit in front of our house. The question is, what do we do with it? Mm -hmm. Because if we, if we, if we choose to become converters, we can turn this shit into a fertilizer. You know, that, that, that all the shit I was, um, Going through in my life, all of it, even, even the suicide, I was, I tried and I'm not there yet. I did not completely, yeah, it's not, it probably will never leave. This is always something I carry in me, but all of this shit, I take it and put it out in the field, put it there as a fertilizer, and then I put some seeds. And this is, in the end, a really good fertilizer because I was growing from these moments in a way that I could never explain in words. And this, this makes us stronger, even though I would rather give things back if they would not have happened. Uh, if I could, I would 
change them. If I would give a bit back of my growth, my personal growth, but these things would not have happened, I would definitely do it. But I can't. So the things that are happening, I can't change that it was happening, but I can change what I do with it or I can choose. And I think that's a big choice we have to, we have in our hands every single day. I choose hope every day. Yeah. It's not that it's, it's falling into my life like just easy and it's always easy. Hope, yeah, I'm hopeful. I can sit on the couch the whole day and tell myself I'm hopeful, I'm hopeful, do like this, but nothing else. That's not changing anything. But I need, we need this active hope and we need to choose to become the hope. That's that's what I want to share with people because it's up to us. Yeah. So use the shit in front of your house and make something out of it. Let a beautiful big tree grow and uh, and let this grow have fruits with a lot of seeds and share them. Wow. Yeah. Oh, wow, wow, wow. That was... Oh, you're leaving me so speechless <laughs> with that. That was just so, so lovely. I thank you for that metaphor. I love that. Turn shit into fertilizer and let a beautiful tree grow. Love it. And um, that is such a optimistic yet practical way to think about it because I've been, um, I recently started listening to the incredible Dr. Jane Goodall's podcast called, uh, uh, the Ho- her podcast called The Hope Cast. And she talks about these concepts yes. of what hope is. And she always mentions, you know, hope isn't just about sitting there and having these utopian visions for the future and not doing anything, right? Yeah, you exactly. got to get mm-hmm. up and go out there and and use your unique talents and creativity to show up in this world. And that action is part of hope. It's not just, like you said, sitting on a couch talking about hope. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think the active hope, there's a beautiful book, even though it's called Active Hope, uh, from, um, I can't remember who wrote it, but it's a really beautiful book that, that gives a lot of tools as well, how to see, how to look at hope and how to use it. Because like you say, we have to become the hope. Who else should do it? If, if, if not, I am doing myself. I mean, we have to be this hope, what we want to see in this world, what we want to create in this world. And it's our own choice. Every single one of us can choose. Totally. That's what we have in our hands, our choice. Exactly. Yeah. And we'll definitely be sure to link in the show notes, um, your books, the, uh, and info about how people can support your work and the documentary and all that. Speaking of which, we must pivot to this big project of yours, Hope, the documentary. Um, it sounds, from what I'm hearing from our conversation, for you, storytelling is a powerful way of activism. And it sounds like that's your, that, like that, that form of activism and advocacy holds a special place in your heart because of these deep connections that you're able to make with people. So how do you see filmmaking um, as fitting into uh, your avenues of activism? And what can you share with us about your documentary? Mm -hmm. Well, I uh, was uh, starting to make videos for the organizations I was supporting and I was volunteering for. And I saw how much these videos can change because uh, I think that uh, moving pictures, I mean, like video film is really touching. It's uh, what kind of videos were you making? Were they undercover investigations or were they? Sometimes, yeah. Okay. Mm, yeah. Well, I made sometimes videos about the situations that were happening, uh, exactly where I was yeah. and the campaigns on Sea Shepherd, for example. Sometimes I made a bit of informate, informative videos. Mm-hmm. Um, and other times it was investigating. So undercover footage. Yeah. For example, in Costa Rica about the shark fin trade, that was uh, some under, um, undercover uh, footage I filmed. So I did the uh, edit, film, everything on my, on my own, on myself, but for the organizations. And I really, really felt how much this can touch people, inform people. Like videos are, or film is crazy important. And what I want to do with my whole movie now is touching people's hearts. Mm-hmm. Like it's really an emotional video, big uh, movie, because... I want to share as well a bit of my story, how I became the person I am. But at the same time, more or less, I want to share 
So many people who are caring for this world, I want to share that there is so much good in this world. Don't focus just on the bad things. Don't look away. That doesn't help us neither. Look at it, but find a solution for it and start to become this person who is changing it. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, the movie will be a road movie in the end. We, I will move out of my apartment and I will completely give it away and give all the things I have away that don't fit into my new home, which is a van. I will uh, travel in a van for this movie and I will live in this in this van afterwards too because oh, I really? want to go more, yeah yeah I want to go more minimalistic so I want to oh, give away how amazing and um, as I have the the possibility to work wherever sure, I want for the sure. Planet Foundation and with the, my book writing and speeches I can work where I want it's quite easy to do that but still it's quite a big thing for me to give all away what I what I yeah have in my life is your dog <laughs> so going to be joining you Sorry? Is your dog joining you on the road? For the movie, for the movie, it will be probably not. He will not join me because it's too much um, filmmaking, driving to the places and caring for the movie. That's maybe not so so nice for him mm-hmm. because I, if he's with me, I want to care for him all the time. Yeah, well. sure. Um, while we film the movie, he will stay at my parents. They love him. So he has it really good here. Oh. And afterwards, I take him with me and we'll travel to the places in Europe, more or less, where I want to be, where I want to act, where I can do something in my free time as well as a volunteer. And in my normal time where I work, I can work to visit people and the organizations we want to support and to really connect with them directly and um, yeah, make my podcast and all of these things as well. So that's a really, really cool thing. And I'm very happy to do that because... I uh, in, I am since three years now at my home without being on campaign. It's now nearly three years ago that I was on the last campaign. And I feel like, okay, now I it's time to move again. Yeah. <laughs> I'm really happy to get out and to do my activism again and to combine it with my lifestyle. Yeah. yeah. So does the yeah. documentary, um, how much of animal rights or um, the ethics of veganism, is that a core of the documentary as well? It will definitely be part of it. It's not the only only focus because the sure. focus is really the topic of hope. And talk, uh, you can put hope in every topic if you want exactly. to. You can see it everywhere. But uh, the focus is really to find people who care for this world in a way of uh, caring for people, for animals, for the ocean, for ocean, for nature conservation. People who care in their own home for it, who care, who created, started by themselves, but created the foundation or an organization. I want to show that there are many different ways how you can contribute to this world and that there are many people doing this uh, by becoming vegan or animal rights activists or uh, by, by, yeah, just being friendly i mean you know the random act of kindness is a kind of a really i call it reactivism it's kind of one of the most important things to do you don't even have to become an activist a full-time activist as i am you can just start by being nice to people around you and sharing love that alone changes already the energy in the room or in the place where you are and there you can connect to people even easier by becoming this this passionate this person full of passion and I think that's one of the steps too. We can do work on our own mindset, open up for other people, for definitely for animal um, animal feelings, and connect with nature, with everything which is surrounding us, and starting to see ourselves not as the top predators, <laughs> as the top uh, species. You know, we cannot survive without worms, without bacteria, but they can definitely survive without us. So we need to start to see <laughs> ourselves as part of all of it. Mm-hmm. And we need everything else so much more than everything else needs us. So I think we can start to learn to see it from that perspective. So in the movie, there will be many topics combined. Yeah. And mostly it will be kind of a four-act movie. There will be four parts. These are parts what I uh, try to work out as what do you need to, to be able to share hope? What are the components we need? So it will be kind of four different components or three different components to become the hope we need so much. Yeah. yeah. Wow. And how can um, those interested, if uh, where can they stay up to date with the progression of the documentary? If they want to support the documentary, is there any um, avenue for them to do so? Yes, there's definitely possibility to support as well. Uh, well, if people want to get in touch with me or just follow the documentary, I created a Facebook page, but I created it four years ago. Yeah. And now I start to get into it again because for some time I couldn't work on a movie. But the Facebook page is called Hope and the Power of Seeds. 
And um, you can co- follow me on Instagram, LinkedIn, or Facebook. And I share all the time a little bit of updates on the movie, but as well updates on my projects and on veganism and on all kinds of things that are happening in my life or around surroundings. And um, if someone wants to support the movie, that would be definitely a really nice thing to do. I work with a movie production company together, but we are happy to get a bit of more support for financial support. So if sure. a company or a private person thinks, wow, this is an amazing project and wants to support that, then get in touch with me. There are different ways to support me or on Patreon with a monthly donation to follow what I do or a one-time donation to the movie, to my project Hope. Um, it's an association what I founded last year. Uh, you can donate there and this money will be used to create this documentary and to pay the bills. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. And we'll definitely link, um, I'll get all the links from you and I can put it down in our yeah, show absolutely. notes for for people. Thank to, you. Yeah, no, thank you. And um, so through your travels, like it sounds like you've done a lot of travel. You're going to be doing a lot more travel. Um, have you noticed any um, uh, differences in what are what specific animal rights related issues are at the core in these different cities? Like, for example, in one one area, it could maybe they care more about sea life. Maybe in another area, the emphasis is more on companion animals or animals who live out in the wilderness. So have you um, and it, it's it. I feel like when you're traveling and you see all of these differences, it's just going to inspire you to want to participate in all of these different, um, you know, uh, areas of advocacy. So um, have you made have you made any sort of observations on that as to what different people care about when it comes to the other animals we live with on this planet? Yeah, definitely. But I think it's not again as well here. It's not so easy to to say in this place it's more that topic, in this place more that topic. It depends a lot on where the city or the place is, because if it's close to the ocean, many people are living from the ocean. So many people are fishermen, for example. So sometimes they don't know the background, many times, uh, sadly. They don't know the background of how important the ocean is to us. But people start to see that there is less fish. So if they want to survive on fishing, then they start as well to see that it cannot go on like it is now. I think that every single fish should stay in the ocean where yeah. it belongs to. But, you know, some people live on fishing, so I, I cannot judge this. I was not growing up in a place where I needed to live from uh, from fishing. So I can't judge this. But I think that people are which are living from it, they start to see as well there are many big topics. So they might definitely concentrate more on the ocean conservation. Mm-hmm. In my home, it's like, um, for example, my home, the South Tyrol, it's called the northern part of Italy. We are so proud on bacon. We are so proud on bacon and we have about 8,000 pigs in this country, but we sell three and a half million every year as South Tyrolean bacon. We put the stamp on it and call it South Tyrolean bacon, but it's bacon, which or it's it's pigs, which have been growing up in a, uh, in a, in a five uh, floor house in Holland. In, you know, it's, it doesn't make any sense. We bring them here and then we put the stamp on it and then we sell it. And we are so proud of it and call it South Tyrolean bacon. So here, the people who are caring for animal rights, they are definitely concentrated on this mm-hmm. topic, bacon or eggs. And they are t- uh, very much concentrated on transporting the transports that are so cruel for animals. So this is a difference from people who live closer to the sea. Yeah. It has a lot to do with our traditions again, what we con- concentrate much on it. I can imagine people who are living in New York, in places where there is all of this high society, fancy clothing place that people who are activists there, vegan activists, might concentrate a lot on the fur industry. I can imagine that's probably a big uh, concentration there. So it it depends a little bit on where you live, what is the topic in your place. And I think that definitely the the movement or the concentration of your work as an activist might focus a lot on this, what is in your area, what is happening there. Yeah, Yeah, that brings up a really important point of how to navigate these cultural barriers that are put up when it's like, oh, we've always done it this way. This is our culture. But what I think is often overlooked is that there is a very unwilling participant in this culture, you know. <laughs> um, it's like the, the, the animals who are in no way consenting to being exploited and abused to be used in someone else's culture. And how have how do you have these conversations respectfully? Do you 
stick to advocating within your community or when you're doing advocacy to members of another community that you might not have that connection with, it can be challenging, right? Because you are still witnessing um, injustice, but then there's that sense of, oh, but that, you know, I'm not, I don't come from a community of fishermen, so I can't go in and tell them how to make their livelihood. But at the same time, so many fish and sea life are being thoughtlessly killed for just very, uh, just, it's, it's, it's horrifying. And so how do you, um, how do you tackle that, I guess? I um, gave, this is very interesting. I gave about a speech online uh, some months ago with, together with a, um, a person from my country, which is, he's very religious, but he's not like, um, propagating uh, religious beliefs, but he's very much in how to combine the religious beliefs with animal rights. It's really beautiful, mm -hmm. beautiful way of how he is doing it. And he, we together made the online conversation and we invited about, it was about a new law in Italy, which says that all animals should have uh, some rights. Mm -hmm. I even sometimes think, why do we even have to talk about it, that animals have rights? I mean, it should be logical, but it is not. So I know people we were immediately think like we're going to ask for their right to vote or something. And it's yes. like... No, no, we're just saying they should have the right to basic bodily autonomy and to be free from harm. That's not that hard. No, it's not that hard, right? And we were then doing this speech online, but we invited other people as well. For example, one politician, which is very much fighting for animal rights as well in the politics. We invited a butcher and a, and a farmer, a organic farmer, who is really... he. I cannot say that... I mean, I don't agree with what he's doing, but in the end, he's... He is a closer person to me than many people who run around on the street eating a $2 chicken because he tries to give the animals what he has, the best life they can have. In the end, they have still have to die, which is shit. And he mm -hmm. starts to not like it neither. So he starts to change things. It's amazing. But he's not there yet completely. But mm -hmm. we invited him and we invited a butcher who's doing as well like him. He tries to really just uh, sell the meat, which comes from five kilometers around him. So he does not transport animals around and he takes only organic food. It doesn't, it doesn't justify what they are doing mm -hmm. that they are still, uh, uh, right. But they are, there is some sense of awareness are, there exactly. a little bit. And because we invited them, so many more people started to come to this conversation and open up because, you know, the people, what I want to reach are all people, not just the vegans. Yeah. And if I, as a vegan and this uh, religious person, I don't know how to call it in English, uh, uh, he is a vegetarian. If we are talking about these topics, we might just invite uh, just vegans or vegetarians, people who are already on the way. I know we're just going to keep talking to each other <laughs> yeah. and feeling like, yeah, yeah, everything is changing. No, yeah. but no, we have to reach the people who are not open for it yet and to change their mindset or support them in the change. And that's what was a really, really nice talk because I felt even the butcher said he feels so much closer to me as a vegan than to people who just don't give a shit. And they just come and buy body parts shit. and yeah. leave. Yeah. Yeah. So he gives a shit, even though still he makes money with it, yeah. but he opens up. And I think that's very important that we don't um, put, you know, vegans in a pot and not vegans in a pot, but that we come together and share and try to share in a respectful way because people are not there yet or they are not uh, open enough yet or they did not face the same things that I faced. So don't judge, but open up. That's the most important thing. And that's how we can reach so many more people. So that's how I, for example, do it. I try. It's not always easy. And I try to keep myself a bit back sometimes because yeah. sometimes some things are like, yeah, okay, come on. I know. <laughs> but uh, we know that. And um, yeah, that's something we have to deal with somehow, somehow sometimes. But if we, if we don't open up for completely the opposite, then how should we create change? How? Exactly. Yeah, you know, yeah. and that's, I think, very important, very hard, not so easy to do, yeah. but most important. Because then you recognize what it's going to take, because, say, for example, the the person who works as a butcher might not n know that there are other options. And mm -hmm. then it once we know that, OK, job and job security. All right, let's think about how a plant powered food system can still empower you to have a well paying job where you don't have to 
exactly. harm animals. And so we that that helps us create the solutions that are needed and not what we think should yeah. be the solution. It's all right, job is an issue or income is an issue or I don't know, whatever it may be, or like lack of protein is an issue, like whatever your <laughs> issue is. <laughs> like, all right, here like so now we can think of okay, if that's we can we can address it accordingly. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my Makes gosh. Sense. I have thoroughly enjoyed this discussion. You have <laughs> Your stories, your your insights, there's just there's so much to it and there's so much empathy and compassion despite having witnessed so many hor- uh, horrors of the world, you still are advocating for hope. You haven't lost that spark and I can see it and hear it in your voice and I am so thankful for all the work that you do. I'm excited for the documentary. You're going to have so much fun living the minimalist (laughs) van life that I am so thrilled to follow you and all of the updates on your journey. Before I let you go, I like to wrap up with this final question. What does a vegan world look like to you? And you have a lot of hope elements of hope in your discussion. So I'd like you to intertwine hope into this vegan yeah. world, which I think is a given. Definitely. <laughs> yeah, a vegan world for me looks a lot greener, a lot more full of compassion and full of love and um, full of full of passion for each other, full of love for this life. And I think that would be a lot less pain in this world if we would turn vegan, all of us. There would be so le- so much less pain and so much more love, and I think, yeah, I think that's it. A vegan world would be just amazingly beautiful yeah. for every living being, for mm-hmm. everyone. Wonderful. Oh yeah. wow! Thank you again. I think I've said the word "wow" way too many times this conversation, <laughs> but it's just. <laughs> It's been remarkable. So thank you again for taking the time. I know the time difference can make it a little hard to schedule, but we made it work. And is there anything else you would like to share before um, I let you uh, enjoy the rest of your evening? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, I think I think one thing what I want to share as well still is with the things I learned yesterday, I can choose today to create a better tomorrow. So I think that, you know, or what it, with the things that I learned today, I can create a better tomorrow. So learn from the mistakes even. And, and then don't feel like guilty when you did not see it before. I, I felt guilty for a while, but it doesn't help us. This feeling is just nonsense. And there, there is, it's not helping us in any way. Just don't feel guilty for things you have done or supported before. If you choose now, a different way, then you create a better future. And that's what we can do. So learn from the mistakes, whatever they have been and uh, change them up and make them become a fertilizer. (laughs) Yes. Turn that shit into fertilizer. I love that so much. (laughs) Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, of course. It was, uh, it was nothing short of a joy. It's made my morning. Um, So thank you for setting a very positive start to my day as well. That that makes me very happy. (laughs) Take care. Bye. Bye, guys. We at Animal Activism Mentorship take mental health and well-being very seriously. If you are a listener based in the United States, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, which is available 24-7, is one 800 Two seven three eight two five five. And if you are tuning in from anywhere else in the world, please access such similar professional life-saving help in your respective countries and local communities. It is important that we all have access to such care when in need for ourselves and our loved ones. Being an animal liberation activist can be overwhelming and at times leave us feeling dejected. But activists like Maggie, who inspire and empower us 
to remain hopeful and keep fighting while of course being mindful of our own mental well-being are a true gift to our movement. We'll be sure to link Maggie's social media information and website in our show notes so you can follow her work, support her brilliant projects, and the noble missions and nonprofits she works with. Just remember to never give up on hope for a kind, compassionate world. Because it's not only Maggie's mission, it's all of ours. Now, before we sign off, please take a quick minute to rate and review the podcast. It helps others find it more easily. And the more people that find us, the more they can be inspired by the guests we interview on our show and turn that into actionable change for all animals. Don't forget to check out our website, animalactivismmentorship.com and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at Animal Activism Mentorship, where you can keep up with the podcast as well as all things AAM. Accessibility to our content without any hindrance is key to our work here at AAM. That's why it's important to us that we offer our resources for free. So if you like what we do at the Animal Liberation Hour and at AAM and would like to support us, of course, given you have the financial ability to do so, please feel free to contribute to our Patreon. It helps keep us going. Animal Activism Mentorship is so proud and honored to be fueled by FARM, Farm Animal Rights Movement. One more reminder that you can sign up for a free mentor to help you with your activism at animalactivismmentorship.com. So if you're still looking for that sign that you need to be an activist for the animals, here you go. And remember, it will take all of us to achieve animal liberation. So let's stay focused, positive, support one another, and be the change of compassion that we envision for this world. Until next time.